Hello and welcome to On Knit If I Want To. I'm Andrea Mowry of Drea Renee Knits. And this is a little weekly Q&A where you ask me questions and I try to answer them. Today I am wearing my Atun shawl. This version is, I also have one that I knit out of my hand spun, but the one I'm wearing today is Cormo yarn from Wing and a Prayer Farm. It is naturally dyed with, I believe, indigo. And it is paired with spin cycle yarns dyed in the wool for that lovely hand spun shifting color effect for those who don't spin. And I am also wearing, speaking of spin cycle yarns, if you've been following along with their Instagram page, but also they have a brick and mortar shop now called Spin Cycle Supply Co. And they have been playing around with ice dyeing for the past year. And you may have seen my berry pants that I did out of their cotton, but they, as it's been getting cooler out, just dyed sweatshirting. And don't drop things, Andrea. Um, I'm sure there's other words for this. I don't know what it is, but it makes sweatshirts. So I was super excited and immediately got some and made another, I guess I could take this off and actually show you, and made another penny pullover. The penny pullover or is it the penny raglan? I think I always want to call it the penny raglan, but it's called the penny pullover. It is a fabulous um, sewing pattern. It goes up to, oh geez, what's the size range? can't remember what it starts at. I know it ends in the 60s. <laughs> um, but I will link to the pattern below just in case you want to check it out. This is my third one I've made. I really, really, it's just like an ideal, ideal cozy sweatshirt and I love it in the ice diet. It's just fun. And I did it with this cute little toffee ribbing that is from We Are The Fabric Store. So that's what I'm wearing today. Just fix my little headphone here and put my cozy shawl back on. So I'm really excited because I have so much show and tell today. You're not even going to believe it, but let's start with some questions and then we'll get into that, to the sharing part. I'm going to tuck this up here because I'm chilly and it just makes me feel so cozy. Okay. Question one. In a long ago episode of On Knit If I Want To, you mentioned making a pair of socks for your father-in-law out of alpaca yarn. I actually did not make him socks. I made him a hat. Um, so I just want to clarify that right out the gate because this is going to affect my answer to the remainder of your question. But let's keep going. My mom is allergic to wool and finding a substitute for socks seems to be very challenging. Could you share what yarn you used? or any you'd recommend? Are there any other animal fibers you'd suggest for socks other than wool? Do you have a favorite that isn't hand spun for us non-spinners? So I really am basically doing this question because I am hoping that someone out there might be able to help answer it. Um, I, this is, I will admit this is my weak, my weakness. I am a wool user. I use wool everything <laughs> and so I'm not super knowledgeable in subbing out for somebody who does have wool sensitivities um my father-in-law is very sensitive to wool but the hat I knit him still had some wool in it it was a wool alpaca blend from Cascade oh what was it we'll see if I can remember the name I feel like it was like a chain net kind of a yarn but it was really, really soft and um, he has worn that hat a lot. So that's actually my Kingsley hat, which is was one of the first hats, if not the first hat I published. Um, and he still wears it and he really has not had any issues with it. Now, would I knit socks out of it? It depends. If you were just gonna make like cozy slippers to wear around the house, maybe? problem with alpaca is it really doesn't have any elasticity. It's so soft and drapey, which makes it lovely for like a shawl or a wrap, you know, something that you just want to drape. Like if you want drape, alpaca is great. Uh, but for something like socks where you don't want it to become slouchy around your foot, it's really not ideal. Um, so 
I think part of it's going to depend on how sensitive your mom is. Um, I have met a couple knitters that any animal fiber really irritates their skin. So that, yeah, that's such a tricky one. Um, you could try like an acrylic yarn um, because I think, I feel like people use it a lot for baby knits, including socks. Um, but yeah, I just, I'm sorry. I'm sorry I don't have a better answer for this because to me, I personally don't like wearing cotton socks, um, but you could, and I just feel like that would, yeah, I don't think I would recommend cotton unless it was blended with something. So anyways, if there's anyone out there, especially anyone who maybe also has some wool sensitivities that has figured out something nice for socks, that would be so lovely to hear about. Um, because I would like to learn that as well. <laughs> All right, next question. We have, we have a few like touching on other episodes questions in here today. You kind of touched on this in episode 78, but can we talk about laundry day? Historically, I have avoided garments that require any level of special care, but since becoming a knitter, that's obviously changed. My wardrobe now has a decent amount of hand-knitted stuff I dare not put through the wash, and I find myself hesitant to wear these wonderful items because I don't want to essentially have to re-block them after washing. To be clear, the hand washing is no issue, just the idea of how to dry them, have them retain shape, fit, etc. How does someone like yourself, with loads of special care items, navigate this? Side note, my husband has always worn super nice things that we would never wash at home and either dry clean or use the kits that you can get at the store for cleaning garments with delicate fibers and construction. Any thoughts on using these at home dry clean sort of products on hand knitted items? So I have not ever used like a at home kit like that for my hand knits. Uh, basically what I do is, let me actually start with this. The nice thing about wool is you do not have to wash it as often as other articles of clothing. Um, the properties of wool make it quote unquote like self-cleaning. And so I don't have to wash my woolens as much as I'm going to need to wash my other clothing. So that's part of it. Don't feel like you have to wash it every single time you wear it because that's also going to break your hand knit down a lot faster. So you really don't want to overwash. In general, we don't really want to overwash any of our clothing. They're going to last a lot longer if we only wash them when they really need to be washed. So just to throw that out there, you probably won't need to wash your sweaters as much as other articles of clothing. Other tips, just aside from the washing aspect, is layering them over something like a t-shirt. Um, some people even get like those underarm guards that you can put in your shirt. Um, so there's other things you can do as well to kind of help keep your sweater cleaner for longer so you don't have to wash it as much. Um, but I 100% am a wash what you make kind of a person. And so what I do is I wash it, wash it, I wear it as many times as I can before I feel like it needs to be washed. And then I usually have like a little stack in our laundry room. We have thankfully a pretty nice deep sink in there that I can wash my woolens. Before that, I always just did it in the bathtub. And once I have a pretty good stack going, then I will just fill up our sink, which again is fairly deep with wool wash and all the woolens that need to be washed and I toss them in together. And so I just have kind of like a, okay, time to wash the woolens day. Now, as far as socks and things like that, I only ever, you can see my sock box, slop, blah, 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 blah. sock blockers back there. I'm not gonna show you too close because that has something that you can't see yet. Um, so it was just a, a little sneak peek. But I only really use those the first time I finish socks because I want them to be pretty the first time and I probably want to take a photo of them and it's exciting to see them all perfectly shaped. But after that, for something like socks, I literally pick them out of the water, squeeze them out and I hang them. We have a little bar that hangs in our laundry room above the sink and I just hang them up there and let them dry. Now for everything else, just sweaters, I just lay them out. I do love, I've shown it many times before. It looks like a giant mesh Pringle. It's from Coco Knits and it pops open and there's like a little bit of a curve. 
and it's just like a mesh circle and what I like about that for drying sweaters on top of is you get airflow around the sweater instead of having it lay flat on um, towels or blocking mats or something like that it's gonna let it dry a lot quicker I do not pin sweaters I don't even pin sweaters the first time I block them um, because I know I won't do it in the future so I for sweaters I would just kind of take the idea of blocking out of your mind for me I just lay it out in its general shape and size give it a little pat pat and walk away it doesn't take me more than three minutes to lay a sweater out to dry um so especially if you've been wearing it and the thing is sweaters get better as you wear them I believe as we wear them and we block them I feel like everything just settles into place and I love them even more than when I initially finished them like for instance my shifty the other day I put it on and I was like oh this is like so perfect now where when I had first initially blocked it there was just parts of it that were still like not settling into each other not like settling onto my body yet and now I feel like I've washed and blocked it probably only twice and it just like feels like no it fits like a glove so I think if you can maybe shift your mentality a little bit and like it's gonna get better and better every time you do it then that would kind of help because it'll be like oh I can't wait to wear this next time and the only places I try to keep a little eye on um, as you said, with like keeping the shape and the fit and everything is really just like the hem, the ribbing. I tend to like to like push that in a little like doo -doo 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 -doo, because I think that that I don't ever want my ribbing like flaring out, you know, so I kind of help that. Um, but otherwise, I mean, I really don't overdo it because even if it kind of looks ugly as it's laying there, it ends up being fine on the body. Um, and you may have heard me say earlier, you know, I like that little mesh Pringle better than something like towels or blocking mats, etc. I do want to put in a little caveat here that I don't recommend ever blocking on towels. So the thing with towels is they absorb moisture and hold on to it. So if you put your sweater on there, that towel is going to get kind of damp and it's really just going to keep your sweater damp longer. And then sometimes it starts to smell a little more sheepy than we might like. So I highly recommend using either blocking mats, the mesh Pringle, or um, even a garbage bag. So the nice thing about a garbage bag is that it can't absorb moisture, so it forces it to evaporate. Um, I want to make sure that I link, I'm just going to write mesh Pringle. And hey, guess who, guess who had a pen at the ready? This girl. Okay. So, um, again, I think once you get into your flow with it, into your rhythm with it, it just, you don't even really think about it anymore. Like I really, anytime I finish a new project, I'll say too, like if I finish something new, I'll be like, Ooh, do I have anything that needs to be washed? Cause I'm going to go run the tub now. So I might as well throw anything else in there that I need to hand wash. Um, so I'll just throw it in there together. The only thing you don't want to do is hang your sweater to dry because that will destroy its shape and make everything funky and sagging. Um, so yeah, just, just lay it flat to dry and I promise it's not so bad. And remember, you really don't have to wash your sweaters very often. Like don't overwash them. Okay, I hope that helps. All right. Hi, Andrea. Hello. I need help modifying a circular yoke top-down sweater. This, this question scares me a little bit, but I'm going to do my best, everyone. Okay. Whew. I've knit and modified at least a dozen sweaters for my very stocky, broad-shouldered husband over the years. I've only, but I've only ever knit one round yoke, and it did not fit well. I just need to know how to increase the yoke depth so I can add length to it and additional circumference to the arms and body without creating too many ripples or other issues. Having only knit one, I don't have a good grasp on how they're knit in the first place, let alone modifying one. Could you please share a little information on how they're designed or how to increase the yoke? Any help would be deeply appreciated. Thank you. Okay. So the good news is adding length, 
adding depth to your yoke is like the easiest bit. You just keep knitting. That's it. Just keep going till it's the depth you want. Now, let's talk increasing. So here is, I think, the most succinct way that I can kind of talk about yoke increasing, circular yoke increasing. Especially if somebody, you knit quite a few sweaters, it sounds like you're really comfortable with modifications. So I'm going to assume that you've done some raglans. So when we think about a raglan, we are increasing on either side of four raglan seams. And we tend to do that about every other round. So that's increasing about eight stitches every other round. A circular yoke is the same concept, but instead of doing eight increases every other round, we do more than that and we just spread them out further. So instead of doing every other round, you might do like skip eight rounds. Well, if in those eight rounds, you usually would have increased um, eight times eight, 64 stitches. Now you're just going to do that in one round. Does that kind of start to make sense? So you just do more increases and you spread them out further. So that's kind of a way to start thinking about that shape and we are spreading them all out around that circle. So instead of having these angles that are pushing the fabric out, it's being, they're spread out evenly. So that's what gives us that round shape. Okay, so, but let's say you're starting off with a sweater that is looking like it's gonna be a pretty good fit for your husband. It just needs a little bit more. Once you're getting closer to separation, you want more space in that bicep and in the chest and you want it to be deeper. Kind of perfect. What I would do is I would be like, okay, how big am I, like what am I at by the time I'm gonna separate as far as the pattern's written? So go to where they're gonna have you separate, chest and sleeves, and look at what your total body and stitch count is at that point and divide it by your gauge per inch or per centimeter, whichever system you use and see where it's at. So let's say, I'm just gonna throw out real random numbers here, but let's say the chest is at 40 inches and each sleeve's at 18, but you wanna get that chest up to 44 inches and you wanna get those sleeves up to 20. These are really arbitrary numbers, okay? But I just, it's what's coming to me. So you wanna add an extra four inches to the chest and you want to add two extra inches to each sleeve. So now you're just going to do some simple math using your gauge to be like, okay, how many stitches do I need to add to the body and how many stitches do I need to add to each sleeve? So you could work depending on how much you want to, um, how much depth you want to add, you could add one to two increase rounds while you're adding that extra depth or you could do one increase round. Let's say you just need like an extra inch. So work half an inch, do your increase round for most of those stitches, and then do your other half an inch. And now you're ready to separate. You still want a little bit more space. Now is where you could use that underarm to add in some stitches there. So you're gonna cast on stitches for the underarm, and then when you go to finish the sleeves, you're gonna pick up stitches there as well. So if you add, let's say a half inch to each um, underarm, let's say four stitches, I don't know what gauge you're gonna be knitting at, um, but then that would add a half inch to both the sleeve and to the body. So that's another area that's really easy to throw in some more stitches to get it to the circumference that you would like it. Um, so there you go. The really the only thing you need to think about there is if there's patterning that goes beyond maybe the top of the yoke, you're going to have to see, okay, does my new stitch count work with that patterning or is that going to mess something up? And also as far as rippling goes, um, the only reason I think you'd get rippling that low is just if you tried to increase too many stitches too quickly. Um, so if there's a lot of extra stitches you want to increase, I would try and space those out a bit. I would break it up into at least two rounds just so that you're not increasing so, so, so much um, to create that undulation in the fabric. fabric. So I hope that helps. Um, I also will recommend... Um, 
there is so there's knitting from the top by barbara walker is one of my like go-to reference books for knitting your own sweaters she really doesn't touch on round yokes that much though but you could also try um the easy method the elizabeth zimmerman method and i think that that is in a number of her books i can't remember which off the top of my head i would check out um knitting without tears just gonna write that down so I can link it for you. Um, you can even just do an internet search for the easy method, but that might really help too. She does a percentage system and I think it's a really, really great starting place. Um, so there you go, I hope that helps. The other thing you could think about too, one last thing I'll throw in there is Again, if you are pretty comfortable with like raglan shaping, you can actually add in, you can switch from round yoke to raglan shaping. Um, you'll actually see it in sweater designs where people do round yoke shaping to begin, and then down here they'll switch into raglan. Um, so that is another option to add some more increasing once you're done with how the pattern's written, then you could do some raglan increases depending on how many stitches you're trying to add. Okay, I hope that helps. So I'm a newer knitter. I'm working on my third sweater and my first time using the tubular cast on. I have restarted the collar a few times because I noticed some unevenness with the cast on edge that aligns in the front. This time around, I am tempted to reposition my beginning of round marker so I can hide the imperfections in the back and start my short rows in a different position. Are there any drawbacks to this? Would you recommend another cast on method for those of us who can't master tubular? So um, maybe let's kind of work this one backwards. 100%, if tubular is not working for you, use a different one. I love tubular. <laughs> it is like my go-to, but it isn't for everyone. Some people find it too finicky and they just don't wanna do it. And if you're feeling like it looks sloppy, I mean, that is right around your neck. So I completely understand if you're like, sorry, my bangs are like in my eyelashes right now. Um, so if you're not liking how that's looking, don't use it. You could use, my go-to tends to be a twisted German cast on if I'm not gonna do tubular. Um, this is just gonna be a lot of links today. I will link that as well. Uh, but an idea for you to help maybe get that cast on to be a little more even is to start it on straight needles instead of your circulars and it helps it not twist around so much. It's just going to help it be more stable while you work those two setup rows and then you can switch it to your circulars and start your sweater. Now, if it's just where you're joining in the round that is looking kind of funky to you, that you can fix at the end using your yarn tail from your cast on to just tidy that up. Um, so that's kind of something to consider too. It's always going to look a little wonky there, especially before you've kind of secured that end in. Um, so just something to think about. Now, what I'm curious about is that they do have the beginning of round in the front. For me, when I do a top down sweater, I always put the beginning of round center back, unless I am doing something like a um, cardigan, where I'm going to be, that's not going to be in a round, it's going to be working back and forth unless I'm steaking, and, or maybe sometimes a raglan, but even there it's going to be offset, it's going to be with a seam. Um, so I'm a little surprised that they have you have your beginning of round in front. And then I got a little confused too with the short rows because your short rows, the point of short rows in a sweater typically, especially around the top of the sweater, is to raise up the back neck so that the front neck dips a little bit lower and is more comfortable to wear. So I am a little curious as to this pattern. Um, it's just so hard to, without knowing the details. Um, but if you're comfortable moving your short rows so that they are still where they're meant to be. So your short rows should be building up a wedge of fabric at the back neck. So as long as you're comfortable fiddling with that, there shouldn't be any issue there. Um, but yeah, it's a little hard without knowing the pattern to be able to kind of give you some more tips, but I like to have my BOR in the back as well. Uh, but otherwise, 
use a different cast on. That's totally okay. One thing to consider though, if you do use a different cast on, they probably also use a tubular bind off. And so if you're not going to use the tubular cast on, I probably wouldn't use the tubular bind off for like cuffs and hem. Um, just because then they won't match. I'd rather use a traditional bind off, bind off and ribbing. Um, you could even do Jenny's surprisingly stretchy bind off, although that's a pretty distinct bind off as well. But there's some ideas for you. Okay. Also, <laughs> one thing I like to say too is it's really easy to get a little caught up in the weeds when we are knitting something, especially something that like if we're a little newer at it and it's within the first few times we've tried it, it's really easy to be like hyper focused, like looking at it real up close. Um, so take a little step away from it too, because it might not look as bad as you're thinking it's looking. Like anybody else might be like, oh, that looks totally fine. Um, but just something to consider there as well. You can also, if it's just looking sloppy and it's your tubular cast on, you can go down a needle size just to cast on and then go up. Um, as soon as you go up to the needle size you're supposed to be using for when you're going to join in the round and start working your actual ribbing. That might help you out too with evening that out. Okay. Long time listener, first time caller. Hey. I just finished the oxbow for my boyfriend and he loves it. Yay. However, the front of the cardi has started sagging and is much longer in front than in back. I was thinking, it's like a reverse mullet. I was thinking of redoing the button band cast off using a tighter, less stretchy cast off. I also thought I could add a crochet chain along the button band, not the shawl neck, to add stability and prevent stretch. Any thoughts? Thoughts on preventing this in Cardi's in general? So you know where my mind actually went is that you need a tighter gauge on that shawl collar. It's that that shawl collar in general is too long for the opening of that cardigan. So if it were me, and especially if your boyfriend loves it, then I think it would be worth the effort of taking that shawl collar out and re-knitting it on a smaller needle. Um, I think it would be the quickest fix and I think it's gonna last. Quickest as in, maybe not the quickest. <laughs> quickest is not the quickest but as in the best fix in my opinion I'm thinking that it just it was probably fine right when you put it on but with wear and gravity gravity settling in that gauge just continued to kind of like open up a bit so what I would do is go down at least one whole needle size and from where you originally knit it so if you went down two needle sizes I would go down a third and I would just re I would just pull that out and redo it. Um, you could even probably pull it all the way down to like the row that you had picked up stitches. You could leave that in and work from there so you don't also have to re-pick up the stitches. But I would probably just take that whole collar out and redo it. And I think you're going to be a lot happier with it because I don't think it's the bind off that's causing it to sag. I think it's the gauge and it just needs to be tightened up. Um, yeah, I think if it had a really nice tight ribbing. I'm pretty sure Oxbow has a two by two ribbed collar, if I'm remembering correctly. So I think if you had a nice tight ribbing on there, it would look really, really delightful. And it's also going to be really cozy for him because it's going to be like nice and squishy around his neck. So that's what I would do. Okay. I think that's all of our questions. So show and tell time. And I, did I bring them over? Oh, I did. I did. So I, I got some things done this past week. I was pretty tickled with myself. I wrote two patterns, finished a third that I will write next week, post Rhinebeck. Um, and then I finished a whole bunch of not, um, I, I'll say non-work projects. Uh, it all feels tied into my work, but, um, but yeah. So. First of all, before I forget, today I will be at Wool and Folk Festival. I will not actually today. I'm recording this on Wednesday, honestly, because uh, I leave tomorrow for the New York Sheep and Wool Festival. And 
if you are watching this though, it's on Friday. And so today, later today, at two o'clock, I'll be hanging out at the Modern Daily Knitting MDK Field Tent at Woolen Folk with Catherine and Candace from the Farmer's Daughter Fibers and Brooklyn General Store with our big cozy cardies. And so if you're going, I would love to say hi. Please come over and say hi. Again, that's from two to three. And then Saturday in Rhinebeck at New York Sheep and Wool, we will be at the Hill as we have been for the past five years now, um, doing our big knit along meetup. This year it's with our Glow sweaters and we are gonna be there from about two to three. We are hoping to take the photo at 2.45. It's always a bit chaotic, but I'm trying to throw a time in there this year <laughs> so that we can, we can get it done. Uh, but I'm so excited and I would absolutely love to see you and say hi if you're gonna be there. So if you see me, don't be shy, feel free to come over and say hi. Okay, so. I finished my first weaving project on my loom. I made these towels, which as I was just saying that I am like such a wool girl, these are made with cotton. This is just yarns beam, I believe. Um, and I threw these in the washer and dryer, which as a knitter, finishing <laughs> things off of the loom is like, what? I'm gonna throw this in the washer and dryer. Um, but it was like magic. The fabric just came together and it is so unbelievably soft. I just can't get over it. Um, so this is my first project. I, you know, my selvages, they're okay. They're okay. Um, but I'm pretty tickled. These are gonna be a gift for my in-laws. They have a black and white bathroom that they redecorated. Um, and so this is gonna be a little thank you present for them, but I'm pretty tickled. It was really fun and I cannot wait to warp up my next project. There are some napkins I wanna make and then I also am gonna try making a scarf. Um, so I'm hoping to have that be my treat next week after I grade and write a sweater pattern. <laughs> It's good to give yourself little rewards. Um, but then, do you remember, I had told y'all about my combination yarn I had been working on, and I started giggling a couple weeks ago because I had finished spinning those singles, and they sat long enough that I was like, I don't even remember what these look like. And I had no idea how the yarn was going to turn out. And then while I was plying it, the whole time I was like, oh, does this look bad? Is there too much contrast? Or like, uh, the wrong colors lining up. I just, I don't know. I was just doubting it, doubting it, doubting it. And then I washed it. And it might be one of my like favorite spins ever. I am just so tickled with how this turned out. So I have three skeins because it was a boatload of fiber. I think I have somewhere between 10 and 12 ounces. It should be about 12 ounces, but you just never know. Um, I, haven't, I haven't actually weighed these up again. So there's my three skeins. And I am just so tickled with how this turned out. And all the different colors. This one might be my favorite. I'm just so pleased. Here's the last one. Yay. I mean, look at how pretty that is. I just... I'm just so tickled. So anyways, thrilled beyond belief with this. And I think I've told you before that I have my most favorite yarn that I've ever spun, which is just some undyed CVM. And it is hidden away because <laughs> I'm afraid to use it. And I think I think I might use it with this because of course I don't have enough of this for like a sweater on its own. Um, I only have three skeins. There we go. Do, 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 da, da. <laughs> um, because I only have three skeins, it's not quite enough. Um, I could do like a shawl. I just think in sweaters these days. I do need to, I miss doing more shawls. It's been a while. Um, so anyways, I am thinking about using that CVM with this in a sweater together like two favorite yarns brought together so we might do that we will see 
And then this turned out so well and made me so happy that now I'm thinking about my Weekender Spin, which if you are participating in the Weekender Spin It to Knit It Knit Along, you have probably seen that there are, or maybe you're one of them. There are people who've literally already spun in it their Weekender. And I have yet to truly begin because I just keep, la 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 la. I just keep changing my mind. I have not felt confident in my decisions that I've been making. So yeah, I've kind of been all over the place, um, but this got me so excited. So this was a combo spin. I grabbed three braids that had some colors that kind of matched up in different ways throughout the braids. And so I was like, you know what? I'm just gonna pair them together. So after being so tickled with how this turned out, I was like, okay, I'm ready. I have an idea, so I'm gonna show you. I'm gonna twist up. I'm not good at twisting skeins, by the way. It's not my forte. I need one of those special little machines that all the cool dyers use to twist their skeins so they don't end up in this situation. But there we go. I am just so tickled. I mean, they are beautiful if I do say so myself. Okay, so here's here is what I am now thinking for my weekender. And color me zany. I am thinking that I am going to maybe just bring this as like my project for Rhinebeck. Usually I always have a knitting project, but I just finished up all these patterns. So I have like nothing on my needles which kind of terrifies me. I did start spinning for socks. Um, this is the most recent fiber um, club color from Hello Yarn. I think it's called Thorn Apple. Can that be right? Yeah, it's gotta be. Um, so, isn't it beautiful? So I'm just doing a traditional three ply. I already have two and a half bobbins on. This is actually my last little tiny braid to spin up. Um, so I might bring this to just ply. Maybe I can wash it and it'll magically dry and I'll be able to cast on socks. I love to think I'm gonna have all this time and it never happens. But here's what I'm thinking for the weekender. We'll see. We'll see if this is finally my final decision. But I have this lovely, it's like blue and gray and there's a hint of like toffee and orange. It's called popple. That is from Hello Yarn, and I'm thinking of that as being one ply. And then this is Brick Wall, also from Hello Yarn. And this has like just a little bit of like purpley, kind of fun, but it also has some of the toffee and the blue. So then for the third ply, I have this Best of You from Wound Up Fiber Arts. And this is a lot deeper blue. Sorry, that crinkling I'm sure is not super nice to listen to. Um, and it does have a little bit of the orange in it as well. So I feel like there are things that tie in with all three of these. So I'm going to lay them out. I need to pull out what I like to do when I'm doing this. And I've had some of you asking about how I do my combo spins. So really what I like to do is I kind of do the same thing that I did when I would create fades out of yarn. And I would make yarn spaghetti and like, just like open up the skeins and wiggle them. And then I'd lay them all together and be like, okay, is there fluidity here? That's what I'm gonna do with this too. So I am going to take all these out of their bags and I'm gonna lay them out next to each other. And I'm gonna take a photo and I'm gonna see, okay, does this look fluid? Cause I think if it looks good like that, then it's gonna look good once I turn it into yarn. I just really love this yarn show you one more time because I just think it's so pretty. I also want to know how all the other hand spinners, like I always have so many ugly ties and I feel like other people like remove some or I don't know how they do it. It's never in their photos. <laughs> Whatever. I'm just gonna knit with it. Doesn't even matter. But yeah, so here's my goal. I am hoping that this is gonna be my weekender spin and then I'm gonna be able to work on that this weekend. So Cross your fingers for me. I will report back next week. And I think that's it. I think that's all my show and tells. Just looking around. Yeah, I think, I think that's it. My new sweatshirt, 
my new weaving, my new spinning. I got to do all my favorite things. And I made a pumpkin cake last weekend. It was pretty good. We have, my whole childhood, my mom made what we call spicy pumpkin bars. And they are, we only got them in the fall and they're like everybody's favorite. And my kids really like them. My husband really likes them. And so I really wanted to try a gluten-free, dairy-free, grain-free version. <laughs> and it was pretty close. My family loved it. I, I think I just have had the other version for so much of my life where I'm like, this isn't really the same. I gotta work. It's the frosting that was hard. It's really hard to replicate the frosting. So I might have to do a little more tweaking, but it was good. We all enjoyed it and it was really fun and we picked pumpkins. So anyways, I digress. I hope that you have a great weekend. Again, if you are at New York Sheep and Wool or Wool and Folk, I hope to see you there. And I guess that's all. Thanks so much for hanging out with me this morning or this afternoon or whenever you're watching this. And I hope to see you back next week. Have a great week.